Um, I suppose you're probably over the disappointment that you're not heading out to New Zealand to defend your World Cup um, in a country where life is pretty much back to normal. But is it fair to say you're relieved to get to be seeing some cricket this winter, or is that too strong a word? Yeah, relief is is definitely an emotion I'm feeling. Uh, we've obviously still got ten days to get through without um, getting dreaded. Covid before we can get on that plane but um, yeah definitely excited that we managed to get some cricket in obviously it was due to be a World Cup that we were going to be playing in but um, amazing that we can get out to New Zealand and get some cricket in it's going to be a really important tour for us obviously we haven't played ODI cricket in over a year now um, and we're a year out from what is going to be a huge year for us um, in all forms but particularly in ODI cricket with the World Cup and the Ashes um, it's going to be huge and Obviously, working towards that year is it's an important starting step, I guess, in, in terms of working out what our best ODI team is and, and getting lots of players informed for that year. And I think as well, having a, a big squad that we can pick from, because there's going to be so much cricket over the next two years, it's important that we've got that strength in depth that we can call upon uh, when things are very busy. You've said there, obviously, that it's, you, you, you know, you've basically been focused on T20s for the last year. So... You must be delighted to to be able to to, to focus a little bit on ODIs as, as as well on this tour. Yeah, really happy to to play some ODI cricket again. It's a format that I really enjoy playing. Uh, it's probably my favourite form as a batter to to play in bar test cricket. Uh, you have a little bit more time, um, and you can make those really big match winning contributions uh, for the team. So yeah, I'm super excited to play ODI cricket again. It has been a long time. Obviously, um, COVID has been a big part of that. There hasn't been a huge amount of cricket all over the world. So I think it's a, a really important tour in the context of women's cricket internationally as well, being able to, to get the game on. And, and so much hard work has, has gone into to getting it on as well. Um, the goalposts have shifted quite a lot the last sort of two, three weeks and our medical staff and, and the, the staff in New Zealand have been great in, in being flexible and making sure um, the tour is, is possible. I, how, how much are you looking forward to to going out to New Zealand, bearing in mind their record in the last 12 months with, with coronavirus? I mean, obviously, the, the, the men's team have, have, have had their problems in South Africa and, and obviously the, the, the more or less quarantined in Sri Lanka. But you'll be travelling to, like I say, a country that is, out of, out of all the cricket nations, maybe even the best nations in the world, has, has done well to contain the virus. Yeah, definitely. So once we get through that two weeks quarantine, if nothing changes, it's going to be like normal life, which even cricket aside is going to be amazing just to be able to, to go out and go go to a restaurant and go to a coffee shop and um, just do normal things. Um, and obviously we, we've experienced as cricketers bubble life and uh, it's manageable, but it's, it's not particularly fun. It's, it's pretty dull, to be honest. It's obviously what we need to do at the moment, um, but just the carrot of... Um, being able to, to live normally and enjoy the amazing things that come with touring um, is something we're massively excited to do. Uh, obviously, we've got that two-week quarantine, but uh, I think knowing that at the end of that, we can play cricket and, and we can live as new, normal human beings is um, going to make it a lot easier sitting in a room for two weeks. Excellent. And uh, just lastly from me, um, how are you looking forward to seeing how Izzy Wong handles herself um, in an international environment? Is there any chance she could be called up to the squad or, or is it strictly to aid her development? Yeah, so it's, it's mainly for her development. We want to see Izzy um, around the squad, how she reacts um, and give her a chance to work with Tim McDonald, our fast bowling coach as well. Uh, we've identified someone in Izzy, someone who has real potential to play for England in the future. Um, and that's why we're bringing her along to expose her to different conditions and to give her different experiences. Um, she, we've got no plans to use her in the squad at the moment, um, but obviously if there's injuries, there's no possibility to fly anyone out. So if we have a, a real crisis, I guess she's there to be used. But the main reason for her to come for her to come is to see her around the squad and for her development and to hopefully see um, how she gets better uh, being around the girls and, and being around our coaches. Lovely stuff. Thanks for that. Safe trip out there. Cheers, Henry. Thanks, David. Thanks, David. Uh, we'll go Raf next. Um, Shajin, um, just flag a question in the chat box if you want to ask a question. As, as you'll see at the moment, it's Raf, uh, then Nick, then Valkyrie. So uh, for you as a newcomer, just let me know if you want to ask a question. Cheers. Thanks, Raf. Hi, Heather. Um, 
So Tash Farron has been recalled to the squad a um, couple of years after losing her England contract. Can you kind of explain um, why that decision was made and, and what role she's likely to play in the tour? Yeah, so we've had a few injuries. Anya and Katie George, unfortunately, have been ruled out of the tour through injuries. So we felt we wanted a bit of scene cover. We wanted someone who can bring the ball back in to the batter because obviously that's what Katie and Anya do. So uh, Tash performed really well towards the back end of the Rachel Hayho Flint Trophy. Um, and she's definitely still been on our radar, even though she's lost her central contract. So I think the fact uh, that Tash has, has worked so hard and, and also the fact that those domestic contracts are in place, as meant she's been training when she potentially would have done, wouldn't have done in previous years. So delighted to have Tash back in the side. Um, she's there as, as cover and, and obviously she's got a chance to, to in the nets try and push for selection and, and show off her skills. So um, yeah, it's good to have her back around the group. I feel like she's matured a lot in the last couple of years, actually being away from the side. Um, she's gone gone back and, and had to to find a job as well. And, and she's experienced that a little bit. So she, I feel like as a player, she's got a bit more perspective as well in, in where she was because she sort of got an England contract when she was 17 and, and that's all she's known. So I think she's really developed not just as a cricketer, but also as an individual over the last two years. Thanks, Raf. Uh, Nick, please. Hi, Alan. Um, just following up on that, really, from um, that question from Raf about, about Tash, and I guess more widely the, the domestic contracts and professionalisation, how, I guess, symbolically important is Tash as, a, sort of as an example of what you can now do if you, if you do fall out of the England system, whereas, I guess, in the past players were sort of left with a decision to make and the fact that she's now come back in and also the fact that you can bring Izzy over as a as a young player and sort of a project I mean yeah I guess how symbolically important are, are they both to to everyone else that that maybe now sees that as a chance that, that wasn't before? Yeah so important and having the Rachel Hayho Flint competition and hopefully the 100 this year as well will just give people a chance to show what they can do and, and show what skills they have and that they can put in performances. So it's it's really exciting. And, and Tash has been picked off the back of her performances in the Rachel Hey Ho Flint. And yeah, it's, it's just brilliant now that if someone does lose their contract, they can obviously go into that system. Um, and for us, it's, it's been great as well for this trip because it's meant Tash has been training and, and able to to be, be have cricket as a sole focus, sorry. So um, yeah, it's a great example and it's only gonna help things in the future. Um, and with Izzy as well, she's obviously been training and having her first winter as a professional cricketer, which is, um, yeah, super cool. Does it, does it already feel like there are more players maybe sort of tangibly knocking at the door because of, because of what's gone on the last summer and, and the 41 pros? I think it would take a little bit of time, to be honest. Obviously, the contracts only came in a couple of months ago. So I think it will take a little bit of time for those players to... Um, benefit from that and really see the the upskill skilling that being a professional cricketer can have um and I think it's been quite hard for some players as well because there hasn't been a huge amount of cricket um but I think next summer if we have that full domestic season it, it gives those players a real chance to push their case and, and really knock the door down and you can see people starting to talk about the likes of Sophie Luff um Georgia Adams because they performed so well in those competitions so it's really healthy for us as an England side uh, sometimes that pressure for, from outside can bring out the best in the players that are in the team. So uh, hopefully that happens. And just finally, on obviously you didn't play in ODI last year. I mean, do you, having won the World Cup, I guess what yeah four, four years ago, and um, do you, how much evolution does there have to be between that that World Cup win and and I guess what happens a year on from now? I mean, do you, do you feel like you know where you are with your ODI cricket, or is or is that what this series is going to show you? Yeah, it's funny. I was actually on ESPN the other day looking at some ODI stats. It's not something I do every every night, but I was just having a quick look, and it's it's got everyone down as retired because they haven't played an ODI uh, <laughs> match for a year, which is is crazy, really. Um, but yeah, I, I think we started to to probably see a little bit of evolution in the ODIs we did play um, previously. That tour uh, to Pakistan, uh, sorry, to Malaysia against Pakistan. Um, we probably saw a few changes there, I think, following the the Ashes series in England where we, we weren't very good. Um, we made a few changes in terms of how we want to approach things and how we want to do things, um, 
including as an ODI side. So I think we'll have to reassess that, obviously under a new coach and, and look to uh, really nail that down in the next year, how we want to do things. But um, we've got a really, I think, good core of players, particularly in that ODI team that um, are going to be the core of the team next year. So um, it's just sort of tinkering that and, and working out uh, what our best 11 is and, and how exactly uh, we're going to go about winning games of ODI cricket. Brilliant. Thanks, Alan. Cheers. Thanks. Thanks, Nick. And a lovely segue on to ESPN's own uh, Valkyrie. Hiya, Heather. Thanks for your time. Um, how do you see the challenge posed by New Zealand for this tour? I mean, you've got someone like um, Sophie Devine um, on absolute fire overnight in the T20 format with the, the record um, 100. How do you sort of see the challenge that she and they pose? Yeah, they're a good team. I think it's fair to say they've probably underperformed in ICC global competitions over the last few years, but they've got a real um, group of, of world-class performers. And you, you see it in the big bash, those Kiwis doing very well. Sophie Devine obviously had a, another brilliant big bash. Um, you've got Amelia Kerr, who's improving all the time. And uh, it's good to see Amy Satterswaite back as well. She's someone I've played with and, and good friends with and for her to come back after having a baby is great to see. Um, so yeah, they're, they're, they're still a quality side. They probably haven't had a, a huge amount of depth previously, um, but in their home conditions, uh, they're, they're obviously going to be going to be strong and it's a, a real good test for us of, of where we're at against them. Um, and also a chance to get used to New Zealand conditions um, and expose our players to that. Some of the girls won't have played in New Zealand we haven't toured there for five years, I think. So uh, it's going to be vital for us to, to get that experience of New Zealand conditions a year out from that World Cup. Thank you. Thanks, Valkyrie. Uh, Jeremy Langdon, Sky Sports News. Yeah, hi, Heather. I mean, I mean, how much are you looking forward to two weeks in quarantine and have all the girls uh, steered clear of coronavirus so far? Yeah, everyone's managed to touch wood, stay clear of uh, COVID so far, which is, is great. We've obviously got 10 days to get through now and everyone's on high alert and high anxiety actually to, to try and get through the next 10 days to get on that flight. Um, so what was the first part of your question? I, I, for, I mean, how much are you looking forward to quarantine two weeks? Oh, quarantine. Uh, well, having done it before in Australia, I can't trick myself um, and not think about it too much because I know exactly what it's like, which was my strategy last time. So... Yeah, it was, it was tough in Australia, but this time is going to be a little bit different. Um, we're allowed to train. It has changed slightly. We were originally allowed to train after day four, but uh, I think the New Zealand government, understandably, are quite worried about the new variants. So uh, I think we're going to be allowed to train if everyone tests negative uh, after on day eight, I think it is. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, Henry, but um, so it will be slightly better. So my quarantine in Australia, we weren't allowed out of the room at all until... Um, I think day 13 it was so being able to train towards the back end of the quarantine is going to make a huge difference and I think there's an outdoor space as well that um, can be used to, to get out and about um, once we've tested negative after after a few days so um, yeah it's, it's tough the the girls are, are preparing for it there's lots of support in place for everyone in, in terms of having strategies to to cope with it and um, we've obviously experienced bubble life as well which is is kind of similar um, where you could only go out and walk and, and do laps of the cricket pitch. So I imagine it'll be a little bit like that. Um, so, yeah, we, it's something that we have to do at the moment. It's obviously not ideal and uh, probably won't be a super pleasant experience, but um, we've got the carrot at the end of it that we can go out and live as no normal human beings in New Zealand and, and obviously play cricket. Um, and, of course, only the five T20s were the West Indies last summer. I mean... Have you got concerns about how the domestic sum of those going to take place with the current situation? Because it's pretty bad, isn't it, here right now? Yeah, it is. Um, I think one thing I've learned in the pandemic is you can't look too far ahead because things change so very quickly. So, um, yeah, obviously women's cricket in this country is so hopeful that we can get those tournaments on. The 100 is obviously due to start again this year and the Rachel Hayho Flint Trophy. And we've got a couple of series planned for us as well so it's going to be quite a busy summer if it can go ahead um but yeah there's not a lot we can do about that now we've just got to hope things improve with um obviously the positive news about the vaccine and just one last one the government are trying to clamp down on celebrations in professional elite sport right now um particularly in football but i mean the, the guys in sri lanka are trying to you know do their bit as well but i mean how 
difficult is that for you as a professional sportsman to curb the celebrations when it must come naturally? Yeah, I think sometimes you you kind of forget when you're in the moment, obviously what's going on, but sometimes perceptions are, are very important in sport. So um, yeah, it can it can be tricky to to forget that you're in a pandemic when you you've been tested in or in a relatively what you think might be a safe environment. But um, yeah, perceptions are, are often quite key. Thank you. Thanks, Jeremy. Uh, just on the question around this summer coming, we'll announce our two series in the next couple of weeks. Um, like the men's fixtures that have been announced, they're not currently scheduled to be in biosecure bubbles. They're just around the country. Um, however, obviously, if the situation were to change, we could always revert to that model. So in terms of things happening, and as Heather says, who knows where this thing goes, but in terms of things happening, I'm pretty confident men and England men and England women will have full summers, whether they're in front of fans or in, in bubbles. Um, Raf, please. Okay, um, so Nat Siver is going to be taking on the role of vice captain um, for this tour in the absence of, of Anya. Um, is that, do you see that as kind of preparing her to, to take on the, the full captaincy in the future? And do you think that she has the qualities to be um, a future captain of England? Yeah, there's no doubt Nat's a huge leader in the group for us. I think she's really flourished for me over the last two years. She's someone that I'd go to on and off the pitch um, to chat things through and, and get her opinion on things. And she's a real leader in the group in the way she goes about things, uh, how she trains the intens intensity that she brings um, is outstanding. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to, to having her by my side in New Zealand and, and bouncing things off her. And I hope she doesn't change a thing because she's already um, a leader in this group. Um, in terms of the future, who knows, um, but it's a, a great chance for her to, to keep developing and, and keep growing like she has done in the last few years. Can I, can I grab one more, Henry? Um, Heather, you were quoted in the FICA report over the weekend alongside Alyssa Healy about things that you want to see um, changing in, in women's cricket. Um, if you were put on the ICC board tomorrow um, and you could change one thing in global women's cricket, what would it be? Oh, put me on the spot. Um, there's probably a few things. I, I don't know what the, the main one would be. Potentially, in in terms of the scheduling, would be the main one, I think, um, in terms of there's been a lot of cluster scheduling in, in women's cricket where there's periods. It's a little bit different for us, but a lot of countries have a lot of fixtures at one time, then they have nothing for, for even four, five, six months at a time sometimes. So I think nailing down future tour structures and, and obviously incorporating uh, global tournaments in that, I think is, is quite important at the moment. Um, there was one quite worrying stat, I think I read in the FICA report, I think it was um, a percentage of how many players would, would choose to go freelance over playing for their country. Um, I can't remember what the figure is off the top of my head, uh, but it seemed quite high for me. So that's quite a, a worrying thing. And, and if we can, well, if the global game can get the women's scheduling right, then I think it's it's enabling at the moment those competitions to be a part of, of the international schedule. And I think that will benefit the women's game at the moment. I think probably it shouldn't be something that's, uh, it should be something that has a time limit, I think, because as the game goes, I think we need to be really adaptable. But I think certainly for a short period of time at the moment, I think having those windows for tournaments like the 100, uh, hopefully uh, and some sort of IPL in the future and, and the women's big bash would would benefit the global game. Thank you. Thanks Raf and Molly to finish please. Hi Heather, thanks for your time. Um, yeah just a quick one, I mean it, it's kind of been covered I guess by everyone when, when, when you kind of spoke about your relief at the beginning but um, I mean seeing other kind of sports really struggle to put on international uh, international fixtures, I mean looking at the Women's Six Nations, for example, which which yesterday was kind of officially put on hold. I mean, how, how kind of how much confidence then does it give you to know that you've got so much to look forward to this year in the way of kind of international cricket? Um, fingers crossed it all goes ahead. But yeah, to have this first to look forward to in New Zealand, but then kind of down the line, the schedule is looking looking pretty good. Yeah, it's great. Um, obviously, we had quite a lot of uncertainty as as everyone did during the peak of the pandemic um, from March. So to know what you've got coming up as a, a cricket player is is brilliant. Um, I think the ECB have, have been outstanding in supporting the women's game as it 
as it has done the men's to to get us back playing and to have that that full schedule coming up um is is really great and we count ourselves as a team as so lucky because it's not the case for everyone around the world um there's some boards that, boards that have been brilliant and, and making sure they're getting women's cricket on and uh, there's a series going on South Africa Pakistan which is great to see and um, as a player you want a, a strong global game um, and yeah obviously Covid's potentially um, affected that a little bit um, you hope it won't but um, it's really important that, that we get that cricket on and, and as a player it's it's great to, to obviously look forward and think what trips we have coming up and, and obviously how to plan for what's going to be a huge year hopefully next year of global competitions. Definitely. Well, good luck with the quarantine and getting on that plane as well. Thanks, Molly. Thanks, Molly. Just one more, actually, Heather. Uh, Stefan, please. Hi, Heather. Um, just Hi, um, just um, referring back to the uh, the FICA report. Sorry, I've just got a toddler in the background. Um, <clears throat> two things that the, the report says is that, I know this is referring more to the global game rather than necessarily referring to England and the ECB, but five key findings, two of them, that the pace of change is slow and that the majority of players feel that improvements to remuneration, facilities and coaching are needed. just wonder what you think about both of those things, both, you know, the pace of change and, um, yeah, those comments on remuneration, facilities and coaching. Um, yeah, I think one important thing to note with the FICA report, it was a survey that was done, I can't remember when, but it was at least over a year ago, maybe maybe two years, I can't remember exactly the year. Um, but for me, those comments, I think, were more in terms of the ICC than the ECB, I think. For me, the rate of change with the ECB over the last couple of years has been great, obviously with the introduction of the contracts and uh, progressions that have been made uh, with the help of the PCA as well, and in terms of improving our contracts and, and conditions around those contracts has been great. Um, obviously, the, the pace of the world game from the from the survey suggests it's slowing down and, and that's a little bit worrying, I guess, in, in terms of the, gra the gap growing between the nations that are, are more uh, better, well, better supported than, than nations that aren't. So um, yeah, it's something I think that probably needs to be looked at by the ICC.